I was just mentioning to Augustine that when I first heard him speak uh, roughly a year ago, I had to undergo a paradigm shift with this idea of uh, niche construction for humans in, as part of the key part of the evolutionary process. And I think um, when I heard him, uh, I immediately said, he needs to be here because, not just for updating us on evolution, but also because what we try to do here is exactly how uh, Augustine began, that we're not just interested in a conversation, but conversations that have direction, that hopefully move us forward as a community. And this is why we are philosophy and theology, um, trying to have a conversation with the contemporary culture. So very grateful for both of the uh, presenters and the ideas you have brought here so far. And now to continue the conversation, uh, we have Dr. Margarita Vega. Thank you, Father Chris, and thank you do, um, to uh, Dr. Fuentes and Dr. Deacon. And uh, so my part here is to introduce a little bit of philosophy. Um, so let's see, we can, we are able to relate, you know, evolutionary biology with uh, theology, and more specifically with the encyclical. Uh, so as uh, Dr. Fuentes suggests, evolutionary theory calls for the implication of other disciplines that can help reconstruct the picture of how the species homo not only created a niche where to live, but produced whole worlds of uh, culture. In this talk, I will present some insights from philosophy that hopefully can converge with the investigations and proposals of other disciplines. In particular, I will examine the notions of personhood and collective intentionality, which are, as we will see later, co-implicated. Quite simply, my main point here will be to say that humans are not just individuals of a species, but persons, with all the implications that the notion of personhood has for philosophers. This creates a particular relation between the individual and the species, in the case of humans, and perhaps a surprising one. On one side, the individual is not subordinated to the species because each individual is unique. On the other hand, the individual's chances of survival depend on whether he or she is fully social, that is, engaged and responsible for the well-being of her conspecifics and surroundings. The irony, then, is that indi an individual being that is not completely subordinated to the species finds not just survival, but fulfillment in its relation to the species. These two sides of personhood, individual and social, are encapsulated in the notion of coexistence or being with, being with others. Uh, my goals in this talk will be then to provide to the personalist tradition some experimental evidence that I believe converges with and supports the personalist intuitions about the person as a being that coexists. I'll also try to make accessible to evolutionary researchers from different disciplines the notion of the person as that which reveals more properly what our humanity entails, and also try to enhance the Thomistic theological and philosophical understanding of the person with a characterization of rationality as existing with others. And lastly, I'll try to draw some conclusions related to the encyclical Laudatus as it deals with uh, individual responsibility and cooperation. So let's see first what is a person. What is a person? Well, there is a general consensus in the literature on the necessary conditions for metaphysical personhood. And this complex definition of personhood contrasts with the earliest formulation of personhood by Boethius. Uh, who said that a person is an individual substance of a rational nature and with Aquinas's further elaboration. However, in this paper, I would like to uh, focus on an aspect of personhood that has been noted frequently in the phenomenological existentialist and personalist traditions. The fact that being a person means coexistence, that is, existing with others. We can see this in the continental philosophical tradition, more specifically Heidegger, and philosophers of dialogue like Buber, Levinas, and personalists like Carl Voltilla and Leonardo Polo. So for example, we have Heidegger. For Heidegger, human existence is essentially social. This is 
easy to see from a developmental point of view. Our survival will be seriously compromised in isolation. However, our coexistence is something more than developmental. We are constitutively and existing with others kind of beings, as uh, Heidegger says there. In other words, for Dasein, uh, its way of existence is coexistence. Uh, personalist philosopher uh, Leonardo Polo has expressed this same idea, saying that the crucial fact about person is that persons is that while other physical substances exist in isolation, persons have a constitutive openness to others, to the point that they will not be what they are if they did not have this existing with condition. And we can also bring here Hannah Arendt, who noticed that even when in solitude, we are in company. Nonetheless, on first consideration, it does not look like we are the only ones uh, that exist with. In a trivial way, everything that exists coexists. Non-living physical entities exist in a state of relationality. The bricks and planks of this building, uh, for example, are um, together because of the particular configuration uh, among them. However, uh, one important difference, although a uh, questionable one, uh, uh, is that bricks or planks do not have awareness. So things change quite a bit for entities that have awareness and self-regulation. And in this regard, developmental comparative psychology and ethology provide evidence that great uh, apes, our closest relatives, have cognitive mechanisms capable of recognizing individuals in their social group and forming dominance and affiliative relationships with them and recognizing third parties' social relationships with one another, such as parent or dominant or friend, and taking this into account. In particular, and this is Tomasello, uh, says that chimpanzees know that others see things, know things, and make inferences about things. Great apes sometimes even attempt to manipulate what others experience. The question then is, uh, if non-human sentient beings live with others, is there a kind of coexistence that is peculiar of humans as, per as persons? It would seem that the fact that we are rational creatures should take care of the peculiarities of our coexistence. In other words, because we are smarter, we are also able to engage in complex social relations. In this regard, it is tempting to see our evolutionary success as the result of our cognitive abilities. However, while the role of our intellectual capacities in coping successfully with our environment is undeniable, uh, there are some nuances. First, animals are also smart, somewhat smart. Researchers find that great apes exhibit thinking capacities somehow related to what humans do. In great apes, we find protomodus tollens, exclusion inferences characteristic of disjunctive syllogisms, and protonegation as simply comprising exclusionary opposites on a scale of contrary, such as presence, absence, noise, uh, silence, safety, danger, etc. At the same time, uh, there are a significant number of limitations noticed by ethologists and developmental psychologists who acknowledge too that some key things relative to human linguistic communication are missing. In this regard, I find surprising what Tomasello takes to be our most peculiar cognitive specificity in comparison with great apes and non rational animals in general, and that is the following human linguistic constructions are created with adaptations for the recipient's knowledge, expectations, and perspective in mind. So in the case of great ape communication, Tomasello states that basically what is missing in all those aspects of human grammar, the conceptually, sorry, basically what is missing is all those aspects of human grammar that conceptually structure constructions for others and their knowledge, expectations, and perspective. The linguistic apes have learned items that indicate their own desire 
But what is missing is all those aspects of syntax that are geared at making the utterance comprehensible to the recipient, a key part of the cooperative motive. This suggests, according to, to Tomasello, that the root of the complexity in thought and language humans is found in the capacity for cooperation that our species exhibits. In other words, for Tomasello, thinking arose from cooperation. So it would seem then that the modern humans are capable of cognitive and linguistic behavior that is not found in great apes. Of course, in other, it's not found in other species either, because we are endowed for cooperation. Tomasello then wonders what evolutionary mechanisms led to this kind of cooperative behavior and cooperative thinking. According to Tomasello, it was the scarcity in the food supply that would have led our ancestors to engage in more cooperative ways. However, that approach addresses only the how the cooperative mechanisms were put into action and developed but know what those mechanisms are. The question, at least for a philosopher, is what made possible the development of those cooperative adaptive mechanisms. In other words, there must be some initial tendency that precedes cooperation, a capacity for cognitive and volitional self-knowledge and knowledge of others. What cognitive and systemic mechanisms allow for cooperative behavior? And this is where we're going to talk about collective intentionality. Uh, the proposal here is that what makes this cooperation possible, and therefore what allows the development of human thought, is collective intentionality. What is collective intentionality? Well, philosophers have customarily focused their attention on the question of individual intentionality, namely, I intentional states and propositional attitudes. However, I intentional states are not able to capture many of the situations we are presented in our daily life. At a store, the cashier and the customer are involved in a common activity by which the patron tend, 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 tenders her credit card as a way of making a payment and the cashier processes the car and hands out the merchandise. Some theories have proposed that this transaction cannot be totally reduced to I intentional states. For example, and this is the way they explain it, if I know that you know that you, I'm giving you the car and you, know, you are supposed to give me my merchandise, and you know that I know that you know, then another recursive level could be applied by which I know that you know that I know that you know, and so on, and I cannot say any farther, <laughs> in a way that it will be make it impossible for something like a joint action to take place, but only a potentially infinite recursive chain of individual intentions and actions. One way out of this problem is to propose a kind of collective intentionality, a we instead of I intentionality, by which we intend to perform A, or we are now performing A. Although such collective intention, of course, is rooted in the individual minds of the participants. So collective intentionality consists of collective prior intentions and collective intentions in action, but could also include shared intention, joint attention, uh, shared belief, collective recognition, acceptance, and collective emotion. Tomasello believes that collective intentionality is proper of modern humans, and he does not ascribe it to animals, because according to his investigations, the kind of cooperative behavior that modern humans display is not found in our closer evolutionary relatives, the great apes. On the other hand, in the work of John Cyril, who coined the term in 1990, collective intentionality is generally a capacity that is found also in animals when they engage in any coordinated activity. A pack of hyenas hunting prey will exhibit collective intentionality. Of course, for Cyril, this collective intentionality is not linguistic and is not normative either. So let's see then what does it mean to have a collective intentionality that is normative, that is deontological. 
To a certain extent, the conceptual differences between Cyril and Tomasello are mainly linguistic, related to how widely or narrowly the term collective intentionality should be applied. While for Cyril, non-human animals possess collective intentionality, but not a deontological one, which is exclusive to humans, for Tomasello, the term collective intentionality should include the normative component, and this is only found in our species. In the end, they both agree in reserving the deontological element to rational animals. In other words, and reinforcing the points of agreement between Tomasello and Cyril, human collective intentionality in humans is typically deontological. It has the capacity to engage in coordinated activity with others in a way that is able to commit to desire independent reasons for action that create rights and obligations. In this regard, we should more appropriately say that the kind of group behavior that non-human animals exhibit, in many cases extremely sophisticated, is better understood as a coordination of actions where the individual action is oriented to satisfy an individual's natural tendencies. In properly human collective intentionality, then, we find a deontology by which the individual is able to make another individual's goals and desires his or her own, not just in relation to the individual's beneficial outcome in the coordinated action, but as the outcome relates to the other as other or as a group. And this is the root of the deontology that we find in the collective intentionality that is typical of humans. The kind of collective intentionality then that we find in humans entails normativity. To be capable of winning intentionality shows that we can create desire independent reasons for action. And that is crucial about, about the way humans cooperate and it's actually is one of the pillars uh, of human civilization or how human civilization is built. So creating desire independent reasons for action does not mean that in our decisions and actions all desire is suppressed because without desire practical reason our ability to put intentions into actions is not possible. So desire independent reasons for action refer precisely to the fact that in making a decision, I may be able to act on a reason that may not be my personal inclination that I can choose because it is someone else's desire that I make my own, or because it is required by the group to which I belong or I wish to belong to, or because of the compelling force of the obligation undertaken. And here we can see Obama taking a huge obligation. Participants in a collective action not only share common goals, but also subject themselves to third-person rules that have a deontology, that is, rights and obligations for the participants derived solely from the collective acceptance of status functions by the group members. Of course, uh, we need to go deeper into how this deontology is possible. Uh, the deontology that we find in human collective intentionality has certain implications. It entails cognitive um, volitive indeterminacy towards the stimulus. And what this means is that cognitively we can represent more than what is given to us immediately, and volitionally we are not causally determined by the object of our perception or our imagination or our thinking. And maybe using Tomasello's um, words can make this uh, uh, obscure philosophical statement a little bit uh, clearer and closer to home. Tomasello notices, and this is a long, long quote, so just brace yourselves <laughs> for it, says, uh, only humans can conceptualize one and the same situation or entity under different, even conflicting social perspectives, leading ultimately to a sense of objectivity. Further, although many animals also make simple causal and intentional inferences about external events, only humans make socially recursive and self-reflective inferences about others or their own intentional states. And finally, although many animals monitor and evaluate their own actions with respect to instrumental success, only humans self-monitor and evaluate their own thinking with respect to the normative perspectives and standards, reasons, of others or the group. These fundamentally social differences lead to an identifiable different type of thinking, what we may call, for the sake of brevity, objective, reflective, normative thinking. 
So when we are able to see situations and the different perspectives, then the mechanisms to create a world of representation are born. It is through representation that we can confer meanings and functions to things going beyond what is immediately given to our experience. Representation also creates the possibility of a detention of behavior, namely suspension of the natural tendency. So we are able to create desire independent reasons for action because rationality creates a gap, puts a distance between the person and her behavior. So the role in representation and language in creating a world that is specifically human can also be noted in what Cyril has called status functions. Cyril distinguishes, following, by the way, uh, Jennifer Hooden's observation, he distinguishes between um, adjunctive functions and non-adjunctive functions. In the case of adjunctive functions, the function is performed at least partly because of the physical properties of the object, for example, a flaked stone stool used for hunting. This kind of agentive functions are used by non-human animals, and some of them even get passed on to other generations. However, in the case of non-agentive functions, the function works because of the collective agreement or acceptance. Uh, the function assigned to the object cannot be performed solely in the virtue of the object's intrinsic physical features. The function is itself performed only as a matter of human cooperation. Cyril's paradigmatic example is money. And if you have attended one of his lectures, you'll see that he always has a $20 bill ready to go out of his wallet. So the physical properties of the piece of paper, per se, in the case of a $20 bill, uh, do not constitute the $20 bill as money unless there is some representation of the function that the paper has assigned. Status functions have the form X counts as Y in C. The space of paper X counts as a $20 bill Y in the context of C, in this case the United States of America, where no structural feature of the X element is sufficient by itself to determine the Y function. Status functions then are adopted by representing the function in question as assigned and also agreed upon by the authorized group or individual. The need for representation is clear precisely because empirically speaking, there isn't anything else there, given that physically X and Y are exactly the same thing. So the, the $20 bill and just the physical piece of paper. It seems clear then the role that the imagination plays in seeing something as something else. This piece of paper as money, this flashing light as a traffic signal, this individual as a tribe chief. This is not just a kind of imagination that simply associates experiences and images, but an imagination that is constitutive of reality, able to see things under different perspectives, and most importantly, under perspectives that do not fall under the umbrella of our immediate or even distant desires, representing things as ends in themselves, however imperfect this grab may be. Incidentally, this seems something as something else is what metaphors consist in. So you can see the role of metaphor here at the root of the building of uh, civilization. An example of this creative uh, use of the imagination can be found in the existence of art. In the fossil record, uh, and I'm sure that Dr. Fuentes could say a lot more about this, we find tools and utensils that may have served a pragmatic purpose, that when objects with ornamental features appear, like for example, the marine snail sails piece for stringing into body ornaments like 100,000 years ago, we see a manifestation of a capacity to consider things for their own sake, a cancellation of utility with the goal of appreciating simply something that is out there. Here's where we can see how cognition and desire for our species go hand by hand. Conceptualizing under a non-utilitarian perspective from an objective, nowhere point of view, also makes possible a desire 
that is not acted upon from the perspective of individualistic desires. In this regard, Cyril states that the truly radical break with other forms of life comes when humans, through collective intentionality, impose functions on phenomena where the function cannot be achieved solely in virtue of physics and chemistry, but requires continued human cooperation in the specific forms of recognition, acceptance, and acknowledgement of a new status to which a function is assigned. So how does this all relate to Laudato Si? Well, so far, we have reviewed cooperation in humans as stemming from a collective intentionality that comp comprises a deontology. This deontology requires an access to reality that provides a gap between action and desire. And uh, this is thanks to the mediation of representation and symbolization. Furthermore, this gap allows us to create realities and see beyond what is presented immediately to us. So at this point, we are going to go back to the idea of human beings as persons that coexist, that exist with others, which, as I said, can be traced back to the phenomenalist, personalist and phenomenalist traditions, and try to see if we can uh, bring some points for consideration that relate to La Data C. I will not present them as conclusions, as I'm aware that I haven't uh, um, argued uh, um, enough here to substantiate them as, as claims. I'm just hoping to, to present to you this inklings, uh, something that we can glimpse from the previous considerations, and also they can be seen as lines of convergence between philosophy, theology, psychology, and evolutionary concerns. First, I think that we can say that the capacity for collective intentionality seems to be in consonance with the fact that we are individuals that exist with, that coexist. Cooperation is made possible by collective intentionality that is consistent with coexistent, coexisting. Collective intentionality in this regard is primitive, basic, and non-reducible to I intentionality, but it is also rooted in our way of existing in the world, which is an existing with. So I take it that the point noted, noticed by Tomasello is that in the openness towards the other, our cognitive capacities acquire a certain directionality and purpose. Human language and thought are structured in ways that take into consideration other people and environments. In other words, the teleology towards the other is constitutive of human language and correspondingly of human thought. An entitative openness to the other, not just in situations of shared intentions and actions, is characteristic of the kind of species that we are. In this regard, it's easy to understand that according to Laudato Si, and we can, uh, uh, I'm quoting here, a correct relationship with the created world demands that we do not weaken the social dimension of openness to others, much less the transcendent dimension of our openness to the Tao of God. Our relationship with the environment can never be isolated from our relationship with others and with God. Otherwise, it will be nothing more than romantic individualism dressed up in ecological garb, locking up in a stifling imminence. The suggestion here, then, is that the intellectual, there is uh, practical openness to the whole of reality, and con specifics in particular, seems to express that our rationality is, is especially shaped by our coexistence. In other words, our rationality is permeated by the type of collective intentionality that is, nonetheless, rooted in individual minds. From this, it follows that our most specific way of being rational is precisely coexisting. As Laudato Si mentions again, our openness to others, each of whom is a Tao capable of knowing, loving, and entering into dialogue, remains the source of our nobility as human persons. In other words, rationality stems from coexisting, not the other way around. Although we have been typically defined as a species by our rationality, even if many other alternatives have been offered, you know, that only um, uh, humans uh, 
build tools, only humans uh, you know, can go to war, and etc. We could say that this rationality is possessed by a coexistence that engages with the world through a deontological form of collective intentionality. Second, and I move on to a different point, human behavior is not completely dictated by the tendencies of the species in that the behavior is not necessarily subordinated to the good and survival of the species. It could actually go against it, as it happened in Newton uh, two years, three years ago. And the behavior can surpass the expectations and boundaries for the survival of the species, as it happens in the case of altruism. Reasons for acting, then, are personal. They may cohere and benefit certain hereditary traits and survival of the species, but in any case, they, are, they have to be created by the person and by personal reasons. Laudato Si discusses this point, our capacity to reason, to develop arguments, to be inventive, to interpret reality and to create art, along with other not yet discovered capacities are signs of a uniqueness which transcends the spheres of physics and biology. From there, we have that the human being is meta-specific. Her acting is not completely di dictated by the biological disposition of her species. So basic biological needs that belong to the human species still need to be assumed by the individual in a personal way. We could say then that the kind of mental life that humans uh, specifically exhibit belongs to the individual, even if it has a we intention mode. Whereas the one that non-rational animals exhibit does not surpass the tendencies of the species, which incidentally may include the preservation of coin specifics and sometimes even extra specifics, it possesses an I intention mode and is individually rooted. For this reason, and now I'm talking to the Thomists here in the room, <laughs> will uh, come at the end to tell me you are completely wrong. Uh, for this reason, in Thomistic terms, it could be say that the intellect belongs uh, to the individual, not to the species. It is personal in that the individual has to develop reasons for action, which implies that every individual has to write a biology. He or she does not automatically become a link in the chain of evolutionary processes. So the human individual then is not generic or specific, he or she is a person. Because human rationality does not belong completely to the species, even if, even if every individual of the human species possesses rationality, at least potentially, Pope Francis notices that human beings, even if we postulate a process of evolution, also possess a uniqueness which cannot fully explain by the evolution of other open systems. Each of us has his or her own personal identity and is capable of entering into dialogue with others and with God himself. Here, just in case you don't know Spanish, just Mafalda is saying, what does it mean, myself? And so Mafalda is an Argentinian uh, cartoon that probably Pope Francis uh, knows very well. So this reveals a peculiar relation between the individual and the group, the species that is not found in other animal species. The individual is not subordinated to the group, precisely because each individual possesses this openness to reality in an individual way. The value of the species comes from the value of, of each one of the individuals instead of the value of the individuals coming from the species. Incidentally, a subordination of the individual to the species or the group will produce a situation of environmental imbalance. Laplace C notices in this regard the disorder which drives one person to take advantage of another, to treat others as mere objects, imposing forced labor on them or slaving them to pay their debts. Slavery, then, in the different forms that it has adopted historically, but that coincides in subordinating the individual to another individual or to the group and using her or him as an object, would be, in the words of Laudato C., the same kind of thinking that leads to the sexual exploitation of children and abandonment, abandonment of the elderly who no longer serve our interests. It is also the mindset of those who say, let us allow the invisible forces of the market to regulate the economy and consider their impact on society and nature as collateral damage. Consequently, the group should secure 
the success of all individuals, not only of those that are more fit, because each individual is seen as having a value in itself. And here we have Laudato Si, which similarly encourages us to acknowledge uh, as part of reality the worth of a poor person, a human embryo, a person with disabilities. In this light, Laudato Si mentions that the biblical accounts of creation invite us to see each human being as a subject who can never be reduced to the status of an object. And the last point, the third point that I'm bringing up, is that cooperation is, not, is an option given to us, to each one of us, individually. We could say personally. Modern humans can survive through cooperation, but they can also choose to act in a way that is not cooperative. For our species, whether we survive or not seems to be more a question of whether or not we cooperate. Uh, and in this regard, no animal acts against its species, his behavior is dictated by it. On the contrary, the human individual can build worlds that are not confined by the limits of her biological species. In this way, our technology, our vast knowledge of reality, our extremely well-connected networks can be a source for adaptation to our environment through transformation, but they can also create pollution, climate change, terrorism, all the things that we see, and uh, even the other possibility of destruction of the human race. For this reason, Laudato Si alerts to the dangers of neglecting to monitor the harm done to nature and the environmental impact of our decisions. The preeminence, then, of the individual over the species is frequently trumped precisely by the world that indivi the individual has built for himself. In other words, a Cartesian dualism will trick us into thinking that our bodies are not part of our personal identity, since mind and body are two separate realms. In a similar fashion, an extreme individualism will put forward that whatever we do around us does not affect us individually or specifically. If we are genuinely beings that exist with others, that can hardly be the case. Given our ontological makeup, there is then a call, as Laudato Si, um, to disinterested concern for others and rejection of every form of self-centeredness and self-absorption in order to care for others and the natural environment. Pope Francis continues that if we can overcome individualism, I think I went ahead of myself, huh? If we can uh, overcome individualism, we will truly be able to develop a different lifestyle and bring about significant changes in society. So we can say that if love can be understood as wanting what is good for others, then it seems that the kind of cooperation that Tomasello presented as the trait of humankind is a type of social love that Pope Francis evokes in Laudato Si when he says, social love is the key to authentic development, social love moves us to devise larger strategies to halt environmental degradation and to encourage a culture of care which permeates all of society. However, care is not a luxury to indulge in only in times of abundance. It is the human way of being. Our species, other species do not need care, but for us, caring for things is an, uh, a choice that we have to make. Because we are persons, we are able to enter into a relation with our surroundings, not solely dictated by, by our individualistic interests, but according to how things are. Um, and Pope Francis says, we are always capable of going outside ourselves towards the other. Unless we do this, other creatures will not be recognized for their true worth. Thank you. <laughs>